We're back talking about the pinhole camera. We've discussed the optimal pinhole size, angle of view, and today we're gonna to be talking about composition. Hey fellow photographers, what did you shoot today? We're back talking about pinhole cameras. So working out what the pinhole composition is going to be or getting an idea of what the picture is going to be like before you take it isn't necessarily an easy thing to do because you really can't see through a tiny hole what the image is going to look like. So let's say you have a, yeah, a digital camera here and you want to make a body cap pinhole and you put that on like so and you go to take your shot, right? So, you know, you can't look through the viewfinder uh, if you have a DSLR. An electronic viewfinder is going to be too dim in most cases to pick up an image. So you could take your picture, you know, whatever your uh, shutter speed is going to be, probably in the seconds, if not minutes, and you could wait. And you could wait for the image processor to, to show you what the picture is. But it's, it's better if you, you have an idea before you go take the pictures, or maybe you're waiting for a decisive moment and you want to make sure your camera is set up perfectly and you don't want to wait around you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds for the picture to take and then look at it and then focus and recompose and then tr trial and error, do it again and again and again. So there are different ways to get around this. Um, first, if you have no other option, you can always increase the ISO, which is going to be um, the gain applied to the signal. By increasing that gain, you're getting a lot of noise. It's going to introduce noise into your picture, but you're going to shorten your uh, exposure times. So by shortening your exposure times, there's less lag between each shot, so you can kind of narrow down that guess and check quicker. Now, if you don't have, um, if you don't have that ability, like let's say you're shooting on a film camera, or if you just want to get something that's a little bit quicker results, uh, we're, we're going to talk about something called flange distance. So flange distance is going to be the distance between the sensor plane and the sort of mounting ring of your lens, or in this case, your pinhole body cap. So there is a set distance, and all of the lenses for the camera system that you're working with deal with that flange distance. So it usually differs from camera to camera. For example, most of the Canon EF and EFS series cameras um, have a flange difference, uh, distance of 44 millimeters. So that's the distance from the sensor to this, this rim right here. Now, because we know that, and I'll link a table to Wikipedia that has a list of common camera flange distances down below, you look up your camera's flange distance, and remember, when we have something going through a pinhole, Right? It's like a projection distance, and that projection distance we kind of equate to the focal length of the pinhole. So if you have a pinhole that's exactly flush with the uh, flange distance or this, this mount of the camera, and most pinhole body caps will be close to that, very close within that range, plus or minus maybe five millimeters, unless you have something that's recessed. But that being said, what uh, we can do is we can take that 44 millimeters and we can try and get close. So uh, I know the, the kit lens from Canon usually goes from 17, 18 millimeters to 55 millimeters. So that has it in the range. Canon makes a 40 millimeter lens, which I would use. Um, a 50 mil will get you just as close. So now we have a full lens on the, on the camera. Now we can look through our viewfinder because it's a DSLR and we can you know, see what the camera sees, lock it down on our tripod once we're happy with the composition and then take this off and replace it with our pinhole body cap. So by matching a lens distance close to the flange distance, we're going to be able to use uh, the optics of that lens to see what we are going to see through a pinhole. So the same thing holds true for film cameras, medium format cameras. So here is uh, a Hasselblad 500 series, V-series camera. We have our pinhole body cap, and it just so happens that the flange distance from the back of the camera, where the film plane, where the film will go, the distance from that to the mount is 74.9 millimeters. So it also just so happens, coincidentally, that the sort of standard lens for this format is an 80 millimeter lens. So we just, you know, most V-series 500 kits 
usually um, the, the sort of the kit lens, so to speak, is the 80 millimeter lens because it's the normal lens for this format. So that being said, we just pop on our 80 mil lens here and we can look through our waist level viewfinder, check out everything is okay, keep it on the tripod and then replace this with our pinhole body cap lens and we're gonna get something that's very similar to what we saw in our um, viewfinder. So that being said, what if you made your camera yourself or you know you have no way of attaching a lens to that camera uh, and, and seeing kind of what the camera would see in a given situation? Well, that's kind of the situation I have here with this homemade pinhole camera. This is a pinhole camera that takes four by five film. So you put a standard film back on here, uh, but you have no way of attaching optics to this or you have no way of you know, there's no viewfinder or anything like that. And this is where you kind of have to go creative. But remember, because the projection is rectilinear and it's going to be light moves in straight lines, I have strategically placed little nails on the top of the camera. So if I'm shooting in portrait orientation, these are on the top. If I'm shooting in landscape orientation, my tripod thread is on the bottom here. And I also have these pins. Now, Two of these pins are actually the hooks that I attach rubber bands to to keep the back in, but they are placed with purpose. So if you notice that there is a pin right in the middle, it should be in line with where this pinhole is. Now it's not quite at the edge, it's a little bit recessed backwards because this, this pinhole is actually, there's some thickness here, it's about a quarter of an inch back. So I tried to get this pin as close to where the actual pinhole would be. So slightly recessed from the front of the camera and right there in the middle. So this will line up with this. Now, these other two hooks in the back are strategically placed so that they will be near the film plane, the corners of the film. So if these are also recessed inwards because the film back sits in here. It goes, it goes uh, the film plane is actually not at the level of the camera, but within the camera. So they're recessed down from this position and they are lined up with the edge of the film plane. So the film holder sits in here and the film plane is roughly where these two things are. That allows me to do some pretty unique things. So what if I turn the camera, if I'm looking at the camera this way, from this, which is the film plane, the edge of the film plane, if I draw a line or look down this plane that goes through this middle pin, that will be the what I will capture in the image. So if I'm looking over here, my, I'm taking an image of something in, in this direction, and I, and I walk over here and I look down here, that's, that's the furthest, that's as wide as it's going to go for the picture. Same thing goes when I look down this way. That's as wide as it's going to be on the left. So by looking at these points, I get my angle of view like this. So now I can kind of get an idea of how to compose the shot based on which direction I want to go. Now the neat thing is, no matter what orientation it is, these pegs on the top do the same thing, right? So I can look down here if I'm doing in portrait orientation, but it has the added benefit if let's say I'm back in landscape and I've got my left to right dialed in, I can also get my tilt front and back because, because these are also, these pegs on the side are also where the film plane is and this is in the center where the pinhole is. Whatever it's going to be, looking, when I'm looking from down below, I'm looking up through these two pins, that's going to be what is the height of my picture, and this is what's going to be towards the ground. So now I have my angle of view in the uh, vertical plane. So we have our horizontal angle of view and our vertical angle of view. It gives us a really good idea of what our picture is going to look like. Now last point about the horizontal and vertical angles of view. Remember that this is based on a rectilinear image, so it has no correction for distortion if we start tilting the camera like this. So what I always do is I always get a little level with me, like a little miniature level. This is a line level that you normally hook on a line between two things. You also have those three axis levels that you can get. They're very cheap. This was like a dollar and fifty cents. The other ones are like five dollars. But now I have an idea. I can just put this on my camera, angle my tripod, and I check the front and back tilt and sometimes the side to side tilt to make sure that if I want a perfectly sort of level image, uh, then I can, I can do that. Now, of course, we can get creative with our, with our angles and you know, do, do different things. 
but I think it helps to start from a reference point of being perfectly level in both directions. So we've talked about different methods on how to sort of visualize and compose the image before we go out and take the picture, whether it be looking at uh, a lens that is comparable in size to the flange distance with these two cameras, or we can just, you know, you know guess and check if we have a digital camera we, by shooting the pinhole. But we, what we would want to do is increase the gain, the ISO, in order to shorten our shutter speed time so we get a good idea. And then when we want to take the picture, we want to use as low ISO as possible. We also talked about, in this example, using these little pins and sort of looking at the direction where these would line up with the pinhole and the film plane to get an idea of our horizontal and our vertical sort of angle of view. But let's talk now a little bit about sort of not necessarily how to compose, but what to compose. And I think this is an interesting topic because we're talking about subject matter for pinhole photography. And we really have to look at the characteristics of what makes a pinhole camera a pinhole camera to understand what may make good or bad images with a pinhole camera. I don't want to discourage anyone from taking pictures with a pinhole camera. I think, you know, you take whatever pictures of whatever you want. But from an artistic sense, we can use the properties of a pinhole camera to sort of uh, complement the types of pictures that we can take. So what do we know about the pinhole camera that we've learned so far? Well, it has a really deep depth of field. So a lot of things in the picture will be acceptably in focus. So given that, we can get some nice landscape pictures where everything is in focus. And on the other hand, you're not going to get that selective focus that you see with shallow depth of field from wide aperture lenses. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, most of the stuff in your scene, in your pinhole picture, will be relatively sharp. So if you're looking to isolate something, a subject, you have to look at a little bit more creative way of doing that because you're not going to get the subject isolation from the depth of field. You're not going to get the background blur that you normally would. So if you want to isolate a subject, you really have to think of how I can isolate that subject without using that as a convention. I have to think of something more creative. So the next thing is, although everything is acceptably sharp, uh, things are soft, right? You're not going to get the uh, refinement of what a lens can provide because a lens is actually focusing points of light into a very tack sharp uh, image. So even though they're acceptably sharp and in focus, they're still going to be soft around the edges. Now we can use this in one of two ways. If you want something that's soft, you can pick, you, you can pick a soft subject matter that will complement sort of the soft aspect of a pinhole image. So perhaps a landscape with a field of flowers or something that, you know, each flower is going to be roughly indistinguishable from the other one because it's not going to be a sharp image, but it gives you that nice sort of flowing feeling of, of the field. And there's, there's plenty of other plays on this. The other option is to go the completely opposite direction and think of something that's normally very sharp and softening it. So, you know, I live out here in the desert and that's kind of an interesting take on it, you know, picturing, taking pictures of uh, cacti. Uh, which are normally very prickly and sharp, and they have very sharp features, and kind of softening that out uh, is an interesting play, I think, on how these images are not tack sharp. And the last thing to consider is the sort of slow shutter speed. There's not really a shutter here, right? But we're going to have long exposure times. So because we're going to have long exposure times, that's the nature that only a little bit of light is getting through here each time uh, we take a picture. So it's going to take a lot of light, a lot of time for that exposure to come through. And because we have long exposure times, it's very susceptible to movement. So we're going to have movement as an element. So if you're taking something, of a picture of you know, something that needs to hold still, uh, that's, that's going to be very difficult. Even the slightest bit in the wind is going to introduce some motion blur. So even on a bright sunny day and using the Sunny 16 rule, this, this camera produces images that take at least one or two seconds to expose. So that's a long time in terms of, in terms of exposure time. And if, you know, if it's any darker than that, it's going to be even longer. I've had exposures into the minutes. So really when it comes down to exposure times, we really have to think about the movement. And I think a lot of long exposure photography is actually really neat because our, our brain and the way we see the world is not in slow shutter speeds. We don't see long exposures. We see you know, our brain is constantly refreshing the images that our eyes are seeing. So by moving away from something that we see normally, I think we get some interesting looks and it makes it a little bit more... Um, more interesting to look at, something out of the normal. So you work that into your composition ideas. 
So good subjects for long shutter speed could be night trails. They could be water. Getting instead of getting that sharp, you know, very crisp water, we have the nice flowing sort of misty effect of flowing water when it, you have a long shutter speed. So really, when it comes down to composition, you know, we it's, it, we can we can orient the camera to get the view we want, but we also need to think in terms of what subject matters make good candidates for pinhole photography, because. Let's face it, you know, pinhole cameras are fun, but they're not necessarily appropriate for all circumstances. So, just to recap, we talked about all the different ways that we can orient the camera and kind of visualize or even see the image before we take it in terms of actual composition. And subject matters for composition that we have to think about are pinhole cameras have a large depth of field where everything is relatively in focus. So we're gonna have large depth of field. We're gonna have things that are soft all over. So we're not gonna get that tack sharp image, but we're going to have that soft, dreamy look. And we're going to have long shutter speed, so that would incorporate movement. So I think those are the three most important sort of subject matters when you're talking about pinhole camera photography and things to photograph. So I hope that was an informative look at how to compose images using pinhole cameras, as well as pick subject matters that may be complemented by the use of a pinhole camera. Next week, we're going to have sort of a film reveal, and I'm going to show uh, some of the images that I took this past month during Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, and we can talk about why I chose those images, why I chose to take those images, and how I think they turned out. And uh, I think it'll be fun. So stay tuned for sort of a film reveal, if you will. And I would love to hear your comments on, on those and, and the work that I show there, because I think it's really about uh, a collaborative effort of, of going out, taking images, and then getting that feedback to make, you know, keep getting better and better at what we, what we uh, love to do. And then after that, I think that's going to be a good wrap up of the pinhole camera series for now. Uh, we'll talk about building pinhole cameras and doing some other neat things later. But I think we're going to transition to our next topic, which is going to be a camera without a lens to a camera with a lens. So we're going to talk about the lens. We're going to start off very simple with the basic lens diagrams, talk about focal lengths and, and different types of lenses, and then we're going to move on to the compound lenses and different things that each lens element tries to correct. So I think it's going to be really fun. I think having an idea of what your lens is doing will help you understand what your camera is seeing, as well as you know what type of lenses are going to get the looks that you want. So it will inform your buying decisions. But uh, until then, as always, happy shooting.